Hi, and welcome to my channel. I'm Ella, and I'm autistic. When I tell people that I'm autistic, a really common response is, yeah, but everyone's a little bit autistic, right? I decided to make this video explaining the autism diagnostic criteria, which shows that no, in fact, everyone is not a little bit autistic. Many people have some autistic traits because they are human traits, but at the moment, if you don't meet the diagnostic criteria for autism as it stands, then a diagnosis of autism will not be given. Side note, as our understanding of what autism is changes, then the diagnostic criteria could change. In this video, I'm not arguing that this is exactly what autism is, more just saying that this is what the diagnostic criteria are at the moment if you were to attend an assessment. Additionally, the diagnostic criteria looks at autism in terms of deficits rather than strengths. The focus is on negatives, even with some traits that could be considered positives in the right environment. So in this video, I'll be looking at what the current diagnostic criteria is, not commenting on what my opinion is at this time on what is autism and what are autistic traits. I think it's useful to look at these criteria if you're someone who's considering attending an autism assessment so that you know what the diagnostician will be considering when they assess you. I'll be looking at the criteria in the DSM-5, which is the manual currently used in the States. I won't be using the exact wording from the DSM-5. Here in the UK, the ICD-11 is generally used, but it pretty much lines up with the DSM-5. So if you're in the UK, this is still relevant. Right, okay, let's get into it. In the past, autism was diagnosed using specific subtypes, including the subtypes of Asperger's and Pervasive Developmental Disorder. The DSM-5 has consolidated these categories and now there is one diagnostic term, so you would be given the diagnosis of Autism Spectrum Disorder. I think this is useful in the same way that I don't like to use functioning labels such as high functioning or low functioning. Categorising autism into different subtypes could lead to assumptions being made about presentation, potential and support needs. Whereas in my opinion it's more useful to know that someone is autistic and then to get to know them as an individual to figure out their support needs and strengths. The DSM-5 criteria is broken down into five lettered categories A, B, C, D and E. Two main sections which look at traits and three further criteria. These criteria must have been seen in multiple contexts for the diagnosis to be given. Side note, this needing to be seen in multiple contexts is why here in the UK when we assess children, generally speaking it's expected that you'll see the traits both in school and at home. This does not consider the autistic child's ability or desire to mask, particularly in the school setting where the pressure to fit in is higher which can make obtaining a diagnosis a really difficult and frustrating experience for the parents of children who mask. So if that's you, I get it. I've been there, I've shed the tears of frustration, and I see you. Right, so the specifics within section A are deficits in social emotional reciprocity ranging from abnormal social approach and failure of normal back and forth conversation to reduced sharing of interests emotions or effect to failure to initiate or respond to social interaction this is about interacting in a way that isn't the expected way socially i would say we could argue that this deficit is actually just a difference for example i find conversation really hard it's hard for me to know when to speak, when to stop speaking. The whole dynamic of the to and fro of conversation is really tricky for me. However, I am really good at imparting information via the medium of a YouTube video or a public talk where I don't have to deal with that, I'm just sharing information. Whereas in the context where my difficulty is just considered an acceptable difference, it's easier for me to engage in that back and forth conversation because my communication style is more accepted. Deficits in nonverbal behaviours used for social interaction ranging from poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication to abnormalities in eye contact and body language or deficits in understanding and use of gestures to a total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication. This describes another well-known autistic difficulty, having difficulty reading body language, facial expressions, etc. I really struggle to interpret nonverbal communication, so Unless someone is really overtly happy, um, I'm generally going to go with assuming that they're mad at me because I, I just don't know. 
and I do struggle to notice when someone is becoming bored by what I'm saying to them. The other side of this is not making the expected facial expressions or gestures or body language. For those of us who mask, we might have actually learned to overcompensate this by making a lot of facial expressions or gestures and putting on the performance that we think people expect from us. Another difficulty I have in this area is in regulating my volume. I tend to talk really loudly, which can be really awkward if you're in a cafe trying to have a sensitive conversation. Deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships ranging, for example, from difficulties adjusting behaviour to suit various social contexts to difficulties in sharing imaginative play or in making friends to absence of interest in peers. I can relate to this and I have gotten into trouble for not being able to modify my behaviour in the context of someone being in a position of authority like a teacher or another kind of professional. I basically treated everyone like I would a close friend with the same level of informality and personal sharing. Additionally, I've really struggled with knowing who is my friend or who to trust because I can be vulnerable to people who have bad intentions. Now we move on to section B, which describes the behaviour associated with restrictive and repetitive patterns of movement, behaviour and activities. 1. Stereotypes or repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech. This includes things like lining things up, echolalia and stimming. 2. Insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines or ritualised patterns or non-verbal behaviour. For example, I really struggle with change, like even really small change, like not being able to do my morning routine in the order in which I normally do it. Additionally, I find transitions really hard. I have to move from one thing to the other in a very routine way in order to cope with it. So, for example, I always do a little bit of reading after I've eaten my lunch. I would struggle to transition into reading, but because it comes after lunch every day, that makes it possible for me. This also covers stuff like needing to eat the same food every day or needing to eat off the same plate every day. Number three, highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. Now, okay, this is the one that really bugs me. Like, why is it abnormal and why is it not okay when it is in fact actually completely normal for the majority of autistic people? Number four, hypo or hyperactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. This point places sensory issues within the diagnostic criteria. I've actually made loads of videos about sensory issues, so if you would like to know more about that, I'll stick some of them in the description box or you can have a search of my channel. So those were the sections which describe the traits that need to be considered for an autism diagnosis. The next three criteria also have to be fulfilled. Criteria C, symptoms must be present in the early developmental period, but may not become fully manifest until social demands exceed limited capacities or may be masked by learned strategies later in life. Okay, so early childhood is generally considered from ages naught to age eight. So it's saying that the traits need to have been present during this period. I was pleased to see the caveat that you sometimes don't see the traits until the social demands become more excessive, which is why we sometimes see children going into secondary school or middle school where the social and the executive functioning demands are greater and that's when we start to see their traits and start to see them struggle, unfortunately. Additionally, it's great to see masking actually included in the diagnostic criteria, but in reality, on the ground, in those assessments, I'm not sure it's really always considered. Criteria D. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of current functioning. I guess this is open to interpretation and it's also putting the onus, particularly in an adult assessment, on the person feeling comfortable enough to disclose the ways in which they are struggling. Autistic people tend to have an uneven cognitive profile, which means we might be really, really good at some things and really struggle with others. And because of this, assumptions about all functioning areas might be based on expecting a more consistent cognitive profile. Finally, criteria E. These disturbances are not better explained by intellectual disability or global developmental delay. Intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder frequently co-occur to make comorbid diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability, social communication should be below that expected for general developmental level. So that's it, the complete diagnostic criteria in the DSM-5 for autism. So hopefully that should be helpful for you if you're considering going ahead and getting an assessment with a view to receiving an official diagnosis.
I'm also going to include some on loan autism tests in the description box which you can take to give you an indication of whether autism might be a possibility and then you could also print them off and take them with you if you go for an assessment. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please hit the like button. I make videos about autism, ADHD and disability, so if you'd like to see more of my videos then you could also please consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching. Goodbye!